Let's pray together. Father, we thank you right now. We ask you, Lord, to minister to our people. Lord, we ask you to help us, Lord, to be a vessel. Take our offering that we gave you, Lord, and tithe an offering. And Lord, use it to reach those people, Lord, that have a need today, Lord, spiritually, physically, mentally. Lord, to help them, Lord, to believe you financially. Lord, to put seeds in the kingdom of God. And Father, we thank you that we can sow and we can reap. We praise you for it, God, in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord, to go with our program today and minister to every people, every person. And Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Turn your Bibles with me, if you would, to the book of Ephesians. I want to talk to you about some of the things I think is very important today. God is a really good God. And I don't think any of the Christians today that I know of anyway have actually been able to comprehend who they are. I think it's so sad today. We're living in a failed society. And we're failed in a failed society because of the people that rule our country. Melanie's talking about how they want people to, you know, to be sorry for Israel and give them money. And you know, you look at the television every day and you got the $25 a month that you can give somebody. Then you got Copeland and then you got Duplantis and then you got all the TBN preachers and then you got all the radio guys. And then you got the SRN News. And then you got the bio, uh, seminaries using the NIV Bibles and New King James versions. They've taken so many things out of the Bible now, all of the important scriptures, they're getting right down to the nitty gritty. What they really thought, I believe, was by the time they got these Bibles out into the marketplace and got them full of the seminaries, got them into the churches that you'd have a group of people that was ready to accept the Hollywood version of Jesus because they're steadily working witchcraft on us. Of course, you're not supposed to know that. It's so sad that people are not supposed to know that and they're not supposed to talk about it. If you do, you're supposed to be an anti-Semite. Even that in itself is a lie. How many of y'all know that Jesus was the end of Abraham's blessings? If you're a Christian today, you're the only legitimate religion of Israel. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled Moses' law. And you as a Christian are in Jesus. So you are the product of our Bible. At one of our programs I saw yesterday, somebody made a comment on it. They said it's revelations, not revelation. Or revelation, not revelations. We'd used an S probably on revelations. So, you know, we have a different revelation all the time. So we used an S. But whatever they said, you are a, and they called us a replacement theologist. How many of y'all understand the word replacement theologist? Anybody in here? They say that we teach that we replaced the other church of Israel. Well, if you look in the book of Hebrews, it says the old covenant waxed old. Or there would not have been a need for another one. And it fadeth and decayeth away. It doesn't exist anymore. I wanted to comment and say something back to them such as, you know, it's sad to be ignorant of scriptures. How many of y'all love your Bible? Amen. I'd like to spend more time, but I don't want to run myself out or some other things I like to say. But being a Christian is such a privilege. I want you to look at your Bible or look at your little piece of paper I handed out. 
It's very important. I talked about the failing system we are in, and we live in a failing system that's full of lies. We looked at the idea of a word called negation. I don't want to talk about that today, but the word negation has the idea of looking at something and denying the existence of it. You know, this is kind of one of the words that we have to learn in our studies and so forth. And it's like walking by faith. And you can look at this real world and you have to deny the fact that it is actually, I don't know, it's there. But walking by faith, you have to deny the laws of this world. For the just shall live by faith and not by sight. The common sense man has to walk by sight. That's all he has the ability to do. But we as Christians have been born again and we have the ability to live by faith. How many of y'all appreciate faith? Amen. And that takes us far beyond sight. If you notice what this says in number one, right at the top, it says, tell us three things which explain why we are accepted in Jesus only. I don't mean that as a religion. I mean we are not in some other religion like Buddhist or Muhammad's whatever or whatever they want to say. We are accepted in the Jesus that we know as our Bible. I used one of the... Uh, root words, and actually I used about three of them in this first uh, question that we used. And the idea of it that Jesus has taken us in verse 6. Look at your Bible. Ephesians 1 verse 6. <clears throat> to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He made us accepted in the beloved, which is Jesus. God the Father has taken verse number three and blessed us with all spiritual blessings. This was before the foundation of the world. God knows everything. He knows who you are. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're all about. And you know, God is busy making the church. He's able to raise you up. He's able to do mighty great things in your life. If you look at this word blessed, I kind of like that because it goes to a word, that's in verse 3 of Ephesians 1. It goes to a word etherel, and it means it's upward. In other words, Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God. Get a hold of this. That's what Stephen said in Acts 7. You can see it in Romans 8, many other scriptures where he is sitting on the right hand of the Father. If you're in the body of Christ, let me hear you say amen. amen. The Bible said in Colossians 2 that we are in Jesus Christ and in him dwelleth the fullness of God. You know what that means? It can't be any fuller. In other words, you couldn't have more power no way in the world, but in the fullness of God, and it's in from the Godhead, he's the head of the body, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That means it's all in the body of Christ. When you're a believer, you have very little people have the idea or they're afraid this is not going to work right and that's not going to work right. And You know, we've got our, our ideas of failure and things like this. But when you look at faith, you find out that if God be for you, who can be against you? You're blessed. All you've got to do is to serve God, walk upright before Him, finish your course, lay up your treasures in heaven, do what you're going to do here because I believe the time is coming. You need to know what spiritual blessings are. We're blessed with spiritual blessings. We're blessed by God. We may not look blessed to the world, but we're blessed. You look at this ideal in verse 6, which I made the question out of it, and I named three reasons. One thing, we're in the grace of God. If you believe grace is an honored, I mean, this is an honored status for someone who walks in grace. I think of it like this when I look at it. Grace is for kings. <laughs> Come on somebody, say amen. Grace is not for everybody. If you're living in the grace of God today, you're a king. Only the kings. Revelation 1, 5, and 6 said, God made us kings. He made that for, he made that grace for you. He made that grace to keep you in a, a sacred place. I look at the devil and I tell him, devil, you're a liar. 
You can't touch me, devil. I'm born again, blood bought, full of the Holy Ghost. I'm living in the grace of God, and you don't have any power over me, devil. If you believe it, say amen. amen. I talked about it like this. I said, entered into a royal blood covenant with Jesus Christ is the only way to become royal. If you're royal, let me hear you say amen. amen. We're not everybody. We are the children of God. We've been blessed. God foreordained us to be blessed. And we are in a royal covenant. I made a question here uh, uh, just a little bit later here. And I talked about the blood. And we'll talk about just that in just a second. But the royal blood covenant is something that God spreads you with. He sprinkles you with when you believe. You as a Christian enter into a blood covenant with Jesus Christ. It's his own blood, the royal blood, greater than anything in this world, greater than money, greater than gold or silver. Talking about 1 Peter 1.18, we've been redeemed with precious things like the blood of Jesus and not gold and silver. When he sprinkles you with the blood of Jesus, when you believe, it makes you royalty. That's why he enters you into his grace. We've been translated immediately in the twinkling of an eye into the kingdom of God. And there's where we stand, free of the devil, and we tell him, devil, you can't touch us. If you believe you're royalty, let me hear you say amen. amen. We are the royal seed of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 9 says we're a royal priesthood. Many people don't know who we are. They look at us like, well, they're just barely getting along over there. You know, they're just a few people and all that stuff. <laughs> I tell them, yeah, devil, you're stupid. <laughs> and only the stupid people believe you. But you learn through our Bible study that you actually, uh, you know, this resonates with the Holy Ghost. He likes that. You know, when you know who you are. You know, God is not, he's not pleased with people that draw back. When you find out who you are, that makes you a little, you know, more satisfied. It's a special honor, and that's two, number two that I brought out in this first question, to be in the grace of God. It's designed for the royal people. You see that? It's not designed for anyone else. This is only for God's chosen. You look here in chapter 1, verse 4. Look at that. You see that in Ephesians 1, 4? He chose us. We didn't choose him. God knows who you are. He chose us before the foundation of the world. Where was that? That's in Genesis 1 verse 14. Whenever they actually made the worlds and the moon and the stars and all of this stuff. God chose you. If you go back to Genesis 1, you look at that in 71, 21 in the Hebrew and that means he called you. But he called you while you was in darkness and he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And when he does that, he actually has something in mind for you. Now many people today don't understand this, but if you look at this carefully, it talks about, I don't want to get too deep into that part because that's really not what my message is about, but it talks about God having something in mind for you and he calls it approaching or accosting a person. If you look at that deeply in the Hebrew, it talks about Maybe in a hostile manner. That's usually about anger. Is God angry with you? No. He won't. He come to save you. But what the devil has tried to do, you know, he's tried to pull us away. He's tried to destroy us. But God comes in terms of the old man. And whenever he sprinkles that blood on you and he calls you out of darkness, that old man has got to die. The new man's got to come forth. You learn how to live by faith. You learn that you're a royal person and you learn some great things. And that Hebrew word, 7121, he calls you famous. If you're famous, let me hear you say amen. amen. Not to the world. That which is greatest in the sight of men is least in the sight of God. And that which is least in the sight of God is greatest in the sight of men. In the sight of men, that goes to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Great men, mighty men, rich men, they're an abomination to God. Somebody say amen. amen. We the little people are the children of God who have rose up against this present day and told the devil, you are a liar, devil. I'm going to finish the work for my Jesus. I'm believing to get caught up in the moment in the twinkle of an eye and so shall we ever be the Lord. And one thing about it, we will be like him. Can I say amen? amen. We're going to be like him. We're going to have a new body. 
That poor old man that went by the church yesterday, no legs. His legs were cut off up to here. Arms. He didn't even have hands and wrists. I know that man's got to be a Christian. He's got to be a testimony to everybody that complains. Poor guy, I don't know how that could happen to a person. But you know what? He'll get a new body. Amen. <laughs> I mean, those are the kind of people, really, when you look at it, that can believe God. You know, people that's having a hard time. These are the kind of people that believe God. These great men, proud men and mighty men, they can't believe God. They trust in their self and they trust in their money. They trust in their fame and being lifted up by the media in America, which is quite absurd. You look at number three in this question number one. Graciousness, the number's 85, it's applied as spiritual influence upon the heart. Why should that make you happy? It also has a word in there, happy. Why should that make you happy? Look at question two and you'll see this. Tell us why happy comes from 5463, refers to being well off without worry. Well, only the ignorant in Jesus Christ can worry. Amen? When you find out if God be for you, who can be against you? We know that no matter where you're at, you could be in a dungeon as Joseph. You could be in a lion's den as Daniel. You could find out you could be in the fire like the three Hebrew children. But if God be for you, who can be against you? All things will work together for good to them that love God and who's called according to his purpose. There's no weapon formed against you can prosper. We're happy, look what it says. I like this. Richly blessed. You see that in number two? Look at that on your paper now. You find that word over here in Ephesians 1 verse 7. See it at the end of that seventh verse? Richly, what? Richly blessed. I want to talk to you about that today. I made a question, and I put it in our Bible study, and you find that Donald Trump, is he brags on the internet, oh, I'm worth $11 billion. And then he turns around on the next page, and he says, I got $7 billion in the bank. Do you know what our Bible says? How many of y'all are a Bibleist? Say amen with me, church. Come on. You believe your Bible, say amen. amen. Here he's got all this money. And in the book of John, chapter 19, Pilate tells Jesus, Do you not know that I have power to crucify you? Answer me. Tell me now. Jesus said, You shall have no power at all except it was given to you from above. God's not impressed with money. He calls it filthy lucre. God will give you everything you have need of. In this world, you don't have need for lots of money. You have need for faith. Remember what this word richly blessed means. The word richly talks about copious, copiously. Now, this is the word, you should write that word down, C-O-P-I-O-U-S. You know what that means? That means you're so rich, there ain't no room for any more money in your life. You're so rich, you don't get a hold of this, you need to get a revelation here, you need to memorize this. Fullness, you know what fullness means? That means like as in saturated, crammed in, packed in, jammed up, jelly tight. You can't get any more wealth in your life. Count your name, man. Okay, let me take you here a little deeper and I'll show you what I mean. Now, the Bible says that Christ is in you, right? Colossians 1.27. That's what it says. Now, if you look at this very carefully, you'll find out that we are adopted sons of God, according to Romans chapter 8. We've been adopt, adopted, but we are nevertheless sons of God, and we have an eternal inheritance. Do you know what that means? We have eternal life, and therefore everything we have inherited, it's eternal. We're going to have it forever. We're going to live forever. What is it? It's the Romans 8, 17. You call that because we are so rich. How many of y'all know if you own everything, there ain't nothing else they can give you? If you know you're a Christian, say amen. amen. 
You know you're a Christian. You know you're rich. God will give you everything you need as long as you honor him and don't get caught up in lust and pride. But you stay humble like a little person should. You stay on your knees. You keep your prayer life. You feed your soul with your scripture. You learn to believe the Bible. Don't trust in wickedness and television and the world. Don't trust in lust and pride. Jesus told him, Jews, in John 8, 44, you're your father the devil, and the lust of your father you'll do. If you were, my, if you were Abraham's seed, you would know me. Abraham had faith. Anyway, he said, Moses wrote about me. If you believe Moses' law, you would know of me, for he wrote of me. They didn't care anything about Moses' law. The only thing they had about Moses' law was something to cover up their wickedness. Nevertheless, the word riches and copiously, it has to do with a blood covenant. Now let's talk about the blood covenant. How many of y'all know why the blood of Jesus had to be used to redeem you? Amen? How come that Jesus offered up his own blood, but it wasn't just any blood? If that's the way of it, to they kill somebody and take their blood and give it to God and say, okay, you know, this is so my family can go home. It don't work like that. <clears throat> we'll talk about this just in a minute. Let's look in verse, question number three. Look at this, and I'm going to tell you about the blood just in a second. Tell us what we don't know about grace and why should we praise the glory of his grace? I covered this a minute ago. It's the grace that keeps us protected. Now, to give you an example, you can look in the book of Job and you would see whenever the devil says, God said to the devil, have you considered my servant Job devil? You ain't been able to corrupt him. He said, yeah. And let me get my hands on him. I'll show you. i make him curse you. He ain't serving you for nothing. You give him a lot of stuff and he'll serve you. Yeah. That's basically what the conversation was about. And God said, okay, devil, I'm going to show you that he'll serve me if he don't have nothing. He ain't serving me for materialism. But don't take his life. You know, if you look at all of this, you find out that Job lost everything he had when God allowed Satan to do it. He come back in a few days and, how you like that devil? He said, well, you know, hey, you're talking about just materialism. He said, let me touch his body. And I'll prove to you he won't serve you then. Let me touch his body. Let me put the sickness on him. And God said, okay, devil, I'm going to prove to you my servant's okay. You go ahead and do what you're going to do to him, but you can't take his life. You wonder sometimes why you go through things. That's the grace of God. You can only see it here in a sense that God did not allow him to do anything that he didn't permit him to do. The devil don't have no power against you. When you live in the grace of God, why well, you find out that you're invincible. How many of y'all know that we translated us, according to Colossians chapter 1, <clears throat> he translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Into his kingdom, not the devil's kingdom, that'd be this world. He translates you into his kingdom. The devil don't have no badge, he ain't the sheriff of God's kingdom, amen? God stripped him of his power. You don't have no power over God's people. Anyway, if you look at this carefully, you can find out that the grace of God is to be praised because it shows you that God's power is everywhere and it's only with his words. How many of y'all know how powerful 
the word of God is, he spoke the worlds into existence. He spoke the heavens, the sun, the moon, stars, everything. God created it with just his words. He ain't thinking about the devil. God can do anything. We're here to live by faith, amen? amen. And to show the devil, devil, you ain't nothing. I cast you out in the name of Jesus. God gave you power over the devil. He said, in my name, they shall cast out devils. They drink any deadly thing and shall not harm them. Shall take up serpents. Now, I'm a little bit careful with that because you can take this off a deep end. You have to stay on humble under the mighty hand of God to bring all those things into your life. And I think it's very possible and I think that's the way it is. Okay, I want you to look at question number four. Verse seven. This is where it gets into the blood. <clears throat> Let's talk about this. Verse seven, Ephesians one. In verse 7, we find redemption, which refers to the Greek word, if you use Strong's Bible Concordance 629. In this number, we find ransom. Explain ransom and tell us why our freedom is based upon this idea. I think that they don't want you to know this. Who am I talking about? Those that serve the devil today. You got a lot of devils preaching the gospel today. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen 13 talks about those devils that's preaching the gospel. You want to know who they are? Go look at those that want to sell you a fake DVD about Ezekiel 38 or want you to buy their DVD. When Jesus said, silver and gold have I none, or excuse me, Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give out of thee. But Jesus actually said that freely you received and freely give. How many of y'all bought everything you got today? What have you that you did not receive from God? Nothing. You don't even have the skin on your body that you didn't receive from God. Anything you got, you received it from God. God allowed you to have it. That's why Jesus said in John 19 to Pilate, except it were given to you from above, you don't have no power against me. You don't have anything that you've done on your own. The Bible said in 1 Samuel, Hannah, the little woman who they despise, God can raise up a beggar from a dung hill. He can take you from a city dump and raise you up and make you a king. Or worse than that, He can raise you up from anywhere and do anything He wants to do with your life. He created you. You don't have no limits except whatever God puts on your life, and he has a purpose in all of us. Anyway, look at the answer here. The idea, and that's question four, of ransom being paid for one who was being held against his will. However, the ransom must be payment. The ransom must be a payment. It must be acceptable to God. Okay? Look in question number five now. Give five reasons as to why the blood was used as a payment for ransom. Okay. We was being held by Satan. I didn't want to be a sinner. Did anybody else want to be a sinner? I didn't want to kill people. I didn't want to rob and steal and cheat. Here I was born into this world. Found myself doing things I didn't even want to do. There's a lot of people tired of sin, but they don't know how to get out. I mean, here we're born of flesh. David said, I was conceived in sin. Born in iniquity. Here you find out that <clears throat> we had to be redeemed by the blood. I uploaded one of the programs we did Friday night, and it talked about, I just uploaded it early this morning, about five o'clock. And I said, why the blood of Jesus? What are you going to give God? If you were going to give him a gift today, my brother, what would you give him? What would you give him, my sister? What would you want to give God? <laughs> what do you have that God does not already own? 
absolutely nothing. How are you going to give God gold? You idiot, he made gold. With his words, speaking it. How are you going to give him something he's already got? Well, I give him a bunch of silver. Don't be stupid. God created all the silver and all the gold. Why and what does it mean that he took the blood of Jesus and redeemed us? The whole ideal is this. This is the blood, the royal blood of his dear son. This has more power, more wealth, and worth more than anything this whole world has. The whole universe has. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. And this blood was received by the Father who said, okay, everyone that shall believe upon the Son of God, they shall be sprinkled with the blood and they shall become royal people and I will adopt them into the kingdom of God with my dear Son. Therefore, when the blood, when our blood flows together, he adopts us and makes us sons of God, children of God, and heirs according to the riches of his wealth, not ours. We're adopted into the kingdom of God. We're very rich. Can I hear an amen? amen? Copiously rich. We have so much wealth that you couldn't squeeze another dime in me. Or I could say a hundred dollar bill, but it ain't even worth a dime today the way these devils take the real gold and they want to give you a piece of paper with written on it, which it don't even say that you can get gold for it anymore. You used to when I was a kid, the money said, gold bearing on demand. Yeah. Right. He took that off. Because it ain't worth nothing. But our Jesus, one drop of his blood. I remember back in the early 80s, as the song come out, just one single drop of blood. I don't know if you ever heard that or not. It's all it took. Just one single drop of blood of Jesus. You can't give him anything he already owns. He owns everything. And then you look at the royal blood. That's touching to know that Jesus, while I was a sinner, Jesus died for me. It's one thing that got me saved. I couldn't understand why that God would fool with somebody like me. I mean, I knew I wasn't no good. And I asked God, I said, God, what do you want to save me for? I said, I ain't nobody. And he told me, he said, I come to save the sinner, to call the sinner to repentance. And I had to cry about that. It broke my heart. I never had nobody to love me like that before. All the people I was used to in the world, they wanted to get something out of you. Wanted to get a favor. Wanted to borrow some money. Wanted to cheat you out of some money, tell you a lie. But you know, here God come along and save me. I thought that was very... Very interesting. Some of the reasons I used <clears throat> look in question number seven or six, I mean. In my paper, which question six rever refers to question or refers to verse seven in our Bible. It said in verse 7, we're told about immediate net worth, where the riches of his grace is spoken of. Can you define wealth? Okay, riches is 41, 49 if you use a Strong's Bible concordance. This kind of tells you about yourself. And he uses this word that I spoke of a while ago, fullness, if you L and E S S, which holds the ideal of the impossibility of having more wealth. It's not possible that a Christian could be any more richer than what they are immediately when they believe upon Jesus Christ and agree to obey their Bible. Agree to your Bible as being the Word of God. Agree to following your real King James Bible and not these books that Harper Collins made which are nothing more than witchcraft books. Anyway, you look at this, it goes again to the riches and the fullness 
which holds the impossibility of having more wealth. And we are joint heirs with Christ who owns the world and we're adopted sons. That's all in question number six. And I look at this word, I didn't finish spelling it, 4130, it says alternative. I only had enough room to write down alternate, N-A-T. But the alternative means this. People have to make a decision today. They can trust God. They can labor for the Lord and lay up much treasure in heaven. And this is an alternative for what they offer you today. They offer you today nothing. This is a failing system, like I said. Excuse me for my hand, I'm not a witch. But anyway, when you look down at the idea of a failing system, you can't even put money in the bank. You let your, what, 41 or what do they call it? The K that you got when you retire? 401K, they want to take that from you too. Oh, if you put any money, you take it out of here that you put in there. Ah, we're going to take half of it. You can't get away from them. You can't get in the stock market. I mean, you may get in one of these big investment companies and they might get you something. But normally you're living in a failed system, the health care bill. Oh, yes, that will protect you. You'll have insurance. Yeah, right. All of these things connects to Luke 4, 18. Jesus said, I'm anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. He's not anointed to preach the gospel to the rich. They don't need the gospel. They don't need a health care bill. They don't need to believe God for anything. They don't need to worry about GMO foods. They don't need to worry about fluoride. They don't have any problem at all. For they're the rich people that Jesus come to deliver the working class people from. And we as Christians today, we need to take heed to what we hear, what we believe. The alternative to Jesus Christ is make someone destined for hell. Destined to a life without Jesus destined to a life in a lake of fire. And yet you look at people today and they're not concerned at all. I talked to a man that had to get out of the hospital for chest pain severe. And at that particular time, he wanted to know where my church was and he'd ready to come to church. But then you turn around, <laughs> you see him a couple of days later when he walked four miles and he had forgotten about asking where the church was. Can I hear an amen? amen? It don't take long to let things slip out of your mind and to begin to look at the idea of foolishness. You remember I preached a few weeks back and I talked about the rich fool. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger. I got me some big money now. I'm going to show them who I am. I'm going to keep on building bigger. And Jesus said, you fool, this day thy soul shall be required of thee. And then, whose do all that stuff belong to now? So, you know, you've got a lot of people that never look at the altern alternative of serving Jesus. How many of y'all believe your flesh is failing? Yeah, your flesh ain't going to live very long. You believe in your flesh, you, you're, really you're really tripping out now. That floor I got to you. Nevertheless, if you look at this, let's look. Go down to verse 8. Question number 8 in my questions and sheets. Me and Mark was talking about this this morning. In verse 8, we that Jesus, in verse 8, we that Jesus abounded toward, for he abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Tell us why this can come from Jesus only. In him all the wisdom and knowledge and prudence exist. If he don't give you the knowledge of this, you're hurting. Wisdom can only come from God. 
You can't have any wisdom and without God there's the world full of fools. God called us out of the world, amen? That's what he done, he called us out of the world. The word <coughs> here that you look up when he talked about abounded toward us. Look in question number nine. Can you define the ideal of abounded? Why is this word so important? He abounded toward you in wisdom and he abounded toward you in knowledge. If you kind of understand where I'm coming from. He abounded toward you and this holds the idea of being with so much wisdom that it's far more than enough no matter what level you're on. You may not even be able to read and write, but it goes to you with common sense. Is what it is. If you walk with God, He'll give you power, love, and a sound mind. You'll have more wisdom than you ever need. You'll have so much wisdom that you cannot have anymore. Because every decision you make will be right on target. If you break these witchcraft things off of you. Living, living in a world full of witchcraft is sad, man. I get up every morning, I have to bind devils and cast them out. The devil liked to corrupt me. He put all kind of things in you and having you to do things against the word of God and having you to do things that don't even help you none. You know, that don't, it just don't prosper. Amen? I mean, that's what the devil does. He's a cheater and a thief. So the ideal of this word prudence is the ideal of your mind. Now, a lot of people don't have the wisdom, but he used the word prudence with it, and it talks about the actions of your mind. Here's where you go to. You want to be wise with power, love, and a sound mind? Learn to pray about your mind and learn to stay fixed upon the Lord. Amen? And you can have the peace of God in your life. That's what the peace of God is all about. And you'll have the right decisions and, you know, you'll be okay. Just do what you have to do with a good prayer life and walking before the Lord. Because when they say He's abounded toward us, you've got more than you ever need. And it goes to the ideal of being so much that you're going to make perfect decisions if you just walk with Jesus. Don't be in no hurry. Amen? Amen? I mean, in one sense you should, but you know, you learn to wait upon the Lord. Because every time you ask for something, you may not see the ideal of success right away, but if you keep waiting on God, don't do nothing but what He tells you to do, you'll be all right. Wait upon the Lord. And He'll renew your strength. I think that's very good. If you look at these root words I put in here, this goes to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, and the gifts of God. Now, when you get saved, Jesus comes in you according to what? Colossians 1.27. And the Bible said in Acts 1.8, He'd give you power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, remember, this is Jesus when you receive the Holy Ghost. He talks about this in the book of John when He said, It's expedient for you that I go away. Because unless I go away, the Comforter's not going to come. Why? Because it's the same one. It's just Jesus in spirit. So he comes in you and he brings all the power of miracles. He brings all the power of wisdom. He brings all the power of knowledge. And here you are. You get the idea? You look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and you find the word prophet in verse 7. God wants you to prophet. What do you call prophet? Man told me, I call prophet, man, and I got a nice sized bank account. I said, shut up and sit down. Idiot. You don't profit because of money. You look up. How I many of y'all know about peace? How I many of y'all ever look up the word prosperity? Oh yeah, yeah, I know that. I seen that. I seen that from yeah, I seen that from Creflo Dollar talking about prosperity. Had me throw that money up on the stage. I said, get in your Bible. The word prosperity means peace. How I many of y'all know that makes you rich? They sell people mental medication today to make you have peace. So you don't worry. Well, let me give you a pill now. Open your mouth. Come on now, be a good boy. Open your mouth. I'm going to give you some peace. 
You don't get no peace out of taking them some kind of mental pill. Can I hear an amen? amen? They'd be taking our poor soldiers and forcing them. You got to take these injections and this is your, you know, vaccines and you got to have these vaccines. Now, boy, stand up our soldier. Open your arm up here. They had them killing themselves 20 and 30 a day. Committing suicide. They didn't have no peace in nothing they the world. It's over there killing people and then they come back and they got all this depression, anxiety and stuff and have to kill themselves. They can't deal with it. They don't have a mind left. They gave their mind over to the wicked. You need to pray for our soldiers. Pray for our judges. Pray for our lawyers. Pray for our policemen. Pray for our firemen. We are all living in a failed society and they do need help. I think it's very good if you look at that question number nine and you find out. You would have to learn to study with these. Meditate on them. When you don't understand something, meditate on it, write it down, get it in your mind, and think about it for a while. It may not come to you right now, and it might. But you know, you'll learn to put scripture on top of scripture, and they'll grow inside of you, and they'll help you. Look at question 10. Prudence tells us three ways that we should profit from prudence. With this gift given to the abundance, and that's what it means, more than enough, we will be above Satan. We never suffer mind control. Amen? With the knowledge of the gift of prudence, we should never suffer satanic influences, especially in a moral character. If you can get people to live right, to stay in the scriptures, have a good prayer life, you don't have to worry about sin. I mean, that only appeals to people that have the lust nature really active. What do you do about lust nature? You learn to kill it with scripture. Meditating in scripture, reading scripture, do it every morning, spend your time in it, write it down. Get the scriptures inside of you and the desire to sin will not only subside gradually, it'll go all the way away. That's why we live in the death of Jesus as Christians. People don't have that idea, they're gonna live for lust. Lust will pull on them. And that's what it said in question 10. Satanic influences in a moral sense. You gotta cast down the demon of fornication. How many of y'all know they're trying to take people that's ignorant today and put it all on the <clears throat> television that, you know, they should be able to be a boy or a girl. Just whatever comes in their mind. And they take the word imagination out of these Bibles that they claim are Bibles. And it takes the word imagination because that's what Satan uses to influence and to control and to destroy people. Look at Romans 1.28, they became reprobate. Romans 1.21, they became vain through their imagination. Why do you think they took this out? They want to control, manufacture personalities, create characters, all of it through control in your mind. And that's where it will eventually go in Revelations 13, when they begin to persuade people to take the chip. <clears throat> Anyway, to make a long story short, you find out that we're living in very controlled society. Everything that you get out of television, in my opinion, it's a lie. They couldn't pay me a thousand dollars a day to watch television. I don't want it, I don't need their money. And I don't want their witchcraft working against me. Anyway, to make a long story short, Satan, if you know how to control your mind, you should never be influenced with sin, lust, and pride because it all comes from a, a, a corrupted person. Sin comes from a corrupted person, whether they're pedophilias, whether they're stuck on po child pornography, or whatever they're stuck on, fornication, alcohol, marijuana, gambling, all of these things are created by the same group of people that's sucking money out of everybody through their mind. Anyway, look in question 12. Or wait a minute, verse 11. In verse number 9, Paul says that he had made us to know 
made known to us the mystery of his will. Can you give us a quick short summary and tell us what this mystery is? By using the word, and check on that word himself, we find that all who are in Christ, both Jew and Gentiles, will be one new man who successfully overcome the devil and obtained eternal life, and that's what our scriptures are all about. You find this eternal life, you find that in Ephesians chapter 5, really, 5 verse 27, I dealt with that down in question 13, when it says that his will for you is to learn how that mind control is putting sin, lies, and lust in people. And you find out in Ephesians 5, you see it right there in verse 27. Is that what it is? Ephesians 1, uh, 5, verse 27, yeah. And it means this. It means that God's going to present you to himself. When you get in the body of Christ, his spirit has a alternative for you, and that's to stay destined to God. Jesus is not going to wreck his own ship. He's going to get inside you. And the Bible said in Ephesians 5, 27, he's going to deliver you to himself without spot, without a wrinkle, and without a blemish. Therefore, you will be standing to God. You look at this scripture here in verse number 4, Ephesians 1, 4, you find that that's what God's purpose is for you. You don't worry about anything. You stay in your place with God. You keep a good prayer life. Read in your scriptures. Stay on your knees. Learn to be humble, meek and lowly. Trust in God. He said, and be holy. In verse 4, Ephesians 1, be without blame, blameless. The blood of Jesus will cleanse you and be before him with your love nature. When he blessed you, in verse 3, with spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, he gave you a divine nature. That's what the world don't have. You look in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, through corruption that's in the world through lust, we have a divine nature that destroys the corruption that's in the world through lust in our life. Can I hear an amen? amen? We overcome the wicked one. We are the children of the living God. We don't have to put up with the devil and all his lies. We stay away from them. Amen? amen. This is what we are. Look at question 13. Now I want to talk to you about predestinated. There's a lot of questions that they talk about and Calvinist and all of these crazy ideas and denominations about predestinated. Oh yes, God's predestinated us. Calvinism and some of those guys were into that. A lot of people don't know John Calvin was a Jew. That's what we read and I prefer to believe that. Anyway, to make a long story short, as, if God has predestinated you to heaven, then what do you have to do? Nothing. Go home and sit down and look at the wall. Go ahead and watch television. Don't worry about it. Oh, I ain't worried about this woman. I got a couple babies by her, but you know, I ain't worried about her. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm predestinated to go to heaven. God will work it out. Well, you know, people believe a lot of crazy stuff. That don't make it right. As I said in the verses before this, when I told you about Ephesians 5, 27, do you see that? He presents us unto himself as a glorious church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And this is all through the knowledge of God. If you stay filling yourself with scriptures, filling your mind with scriptures, stay with the King James Bible, Get you a strong Bible concordance and learn how to do your studies yourself. Don't let the devil put lies in you. Your flesh, if you don't feed it the word of God, you will inadvertently or accidentally feed yourself with the things of the world, with lust. You'll feed yourself. If I had to tell you this, look here. Go over just a few pages with me to the book of Colossians. One, one, one book over. Go over there past the next book and you'll see Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. I'm going to close after this. Colossians 3, 8 says, But now, now see, they had to get saved in verse 5 and they quit fornication and stuff. But here's the things that hold most Christians in bondage in verse 8. 
Put off these things, anger, malice, blaspheming, wrath. People don't know about blaspheming today. They take communion with, you know, like wine, real wine, blaspheming the blood of Jesus. Huh. Come on, man, I got more sense than that, and I ain't even smart according to the world. We're idiots because we believe God. But anyway, look what it said in verse 8. Let this stuff, filthy communication, don't let it be in your mouth. Watch who you talk to. Watch who you spend your time with. And watch about telling the half truth. Look at verse 9. Let not one thing come out of you. Put off the old man with his deeds. <clears throat> one thing you can do, look at Ephesians 3.10 and Ephesians 4.24. This is the ultimate idea for you as a Christian, regardless of who you are. Putting on the new man includes his mind and his nature. Jesus Christ came in you with his nature, but without a mind, you're not going to have the power of God in your life. Get his mind in you with scripture. Re-educate yourself. When you do that, you're going to find out all the scriptures I gave to you today. These are powerful scriptures, man. That changed the life of anybody. Anybody can learn these scriptures and don't serve God? You're a maniac. <laughs> I mean, you've got to be crazy. You're living in a failed society where everybody but a selected few people are destined to die broke and get you in a rest home and take your home, take all your money, wind up taking your check and giving you about 7 or $8 a month and wind up taking that too. We're living in a terrible society today, controlled by a conspiratorial group of people. You know what that means? A conspiracy to raise the prices on everything, to drain the money out of you, to control your mind, and to cause you to want to go to hell, believing in what they tell you by the televisions and they want to kill your children and take them and convince them of the Big Bang Theory. Convince them of, like, you know, you came from a tadpole, God ain't real. And then they might want to tell you that, oh, well, you know, the earth is round. I had wanted to ask them, why is it then that the moon had to stand still if the earth is moving? You ever read that in the book of Joshua? The moon stood still while they were fighting, because the moon moves, they tell you that it don't. It's called Zionist education. We know that that's crap. Everything you find, it's like LGBT children telling your children they can be a boy. Oh, I just become a girl. We know those things are corrupted. I want you to raise your hands with me right now and let's pray together. I believe God's got something for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you right now that we bind every foul demon spirit Say it with me, devil, we bind you. We cast you out. We break your power of witchcraft. We cast you out, you lying spirit. We cast you out, devil, in the name of Jesus. We break your power, Satan. Say it with me, enchanter, we break your enchantment. We cast you down. Charmer, diviner, bewitcher, we bind you and we cast you out. We cast you out. We cast you out in Jesus' name. Now say, Father, fill me full of the Holy Ghost. And Father, I praise you for it now in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, for power, the real Holy Ghost. And help me, Lord, to stay full of the Holy Ghost with my real Bible in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. give the Lord a hand clap. <laughs> praise the Lord. All right, Brother Ken. Anybody need prayer today, you can come up and we'll pray for you. No problem. We got nothing but time. Amen? Come on, Brother Ken, pray for the people.